working? Yes. Okay. All right. So today I'll just introduce you to the philosophy of blueprints. It's not going to be very long. Um, that way you have uh, some background and then you can get into the text. So the outline will be as follows. I'm typing it in. We're first going to look at his biography. So first I'll write his name, Martin Buber. The dates are 1878 to 1965. And we'll look first at number one, we'll look at his biography. And in his biography, we're going to look at two things. We're going to look at, um, <laughs> uh, we're going to look at uh, uh, the influence of Hasidism. Uh, sorry, let me put in number one, sorry, it's going to be biography and Hasidism, right? And then little a is going to be um, emotions and law, and little b is going to be um, holy and profane. Okay, and then we'll look at his thought, number two, thought. And there we'll get the concepts of the, so we'll look at the political climate. And then we'll look at particular concepts that you're going to see, which is the I thou, I it, mostly. Okay, so that's the plan for today. Um, so let me begin a little bit with his biography, so you have an idea who the man is. So, born, uh, let me make sure y'all are muted, unless you, want, you can unmute yourselves if you want to talk. Um, although it's okay, you're pretty quiet. Okay, so Buber was born in Vienna, uh, in Austria, to an Orthodox Jewish family, right? So he was raised in a very religious context. Um, in fact, he was not really raised by his parents, but he was raised by his grandfather, who his name was, um, I believe it was Shlomo Solomon Buber. And this grandfather was actually a renowned Jewish scholar, right? So he was a renowned scholar in Jewish studies. So his whole house was full of books and students and conversations and, and study groups, right? So Buber kind of grew up around this, this eminent grandfather surrounded by books and stories and, and, and discussions. And that's kind of how uh, he became, of course, um, interested in Judaism. Obviously, he was Jewish until uh, his teenage years where he ended up uh, with... Um, uh, going for crisis, right? I'm hitting you all. <laughs> Too noisy. Okay, so he went through a crisis when he was in his teens, right, late teens, and he he kind of gave up on Judaism, right? He he felt like Judaism wasn't speaking to him. It wasn't connect. He wasn't connecting with it anymore, and he turned to philosophy instead. And some of the people he read, we have read also, so you will be able to recognize the influence in his works. So he read Kant, and there is a very powerful influence of Kant in Buber. We're going to see actually uh, today, as, as we talk about the I thou and the I it, we're going to see the, the, the powerful influence of Kant's philosophy, especially his philosophy of respect. We're going to come back to that. He's also, he also read Kierkegaard, and we're also going to have, uh, see some elements of Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, of course, right? So, so he's influenced by all of these philosophers. He has, he's, he's, he's majoring in philosophy. He's kind of put aside his Judaism until he stumbles upon uh, a branch of Judaism called Hasidism, right? This is what I wrote in the, so I'm writing it again, Hasidism. And this is, um, very similar, this is to Judaism, to traditional Judaism, what Sufism is to, tradi to traditional Islam, right? We studied Sufism, right? Remind me, we're in love, yes. <laughs> so remember how uh, we talked about Sufism, how Sufism is a branch of Islam, and Sorry, there's a huge noise outside. <laughs> I'm wondering what it is. Okay, so we, we, we studied how Sufism was a branch of Islam, but it was a branch which was going against many of the tenets of tradition. Um, let's see. I keep on having to mute you guys. Um, so it was kind of a, a, an offshoot of Islam, but also put emphasis on different things. Remember, Sufism put emphasis on the on the on love, on the heart versus the mind versus the rational investigation of scripture. Also put emphasis on um, the, the human emotion versus just keeping the law. 
right, on the irrational components of faith. So very similarly, uh, Hasidism is going to do the same thing within the context of Judaism, right? And we're going to, to study a little bit some of the contributions of Hasidism so that, because they have, thought, they have very deeply influenced Buber's thought. So and we, we're going to have a little uh, introduction on Hasidism, Hasidism 101, and then you will be able to, to get a, a, a good sense of the way that Buber thinks and, and some of the main themes of his philosophy. So um, Hasidism, just on the top of my head, uh, is a branch in Judaism which emerged in the 19th century uh, in Eastern Europe. And you had these very charismatic rabbis who started the movement and they had many disciples and they completely shifted how Judaism would uh, be experienced, right? They, 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 they had a number of uh, points which they wanted to um, subvert in Judaism. And I'm going to talk about two points, the ones that I wrote in the outline. Number one, the emotions versus the law, and number two, the holy and the profane. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about emotions versus law. And you should be hearing Sufism. It's very similar, right, to what we saw with in Islam. So just like Islam, right, Judaism had become, according to the Hasidim, uh, the Hasidim are the ones who are in this movement, Right? This is how we call people who are, oops, sorry, uh, Hasidim. Hasidim are people who, adherents, right, to Hasidism. <laughs> That's how we call people who are part of this movement. We call them the Hasidim. So the Hasidim uh, had some issue with the fact that Judaism had become overly focused on the law, right? And it was missing out on, on the fundamental aspect, according to them, of Judaism, which is relationship right? The, the people were so uh, obsessed with little details of the law. How do we keep this law and how, which laws do we keep and how many laws and at what time and how and so forth. And they become so obsessed with these details that they forgot ultimately that spirituality is about relationship with the divine, right? So they were becoming very short-sighted and where they were missing the big picture or the fundamental picture or the essential picture, which is that we are meant to be in connection with the divine, right? So, so that's the first thing they, they were observing, right? That Judaism had become too short-sighted. They were too focused on the details and they were missing um, the, the, the main uh, point, which was the connection with, with the creator, with the divine, right? So, uh, so that's the first point uh, that they had, that they kind of... Um, were observing. The second point had to do with the notion of emotions, right? Judaism had also become very intellectual, very much like traditional Islam, right? People were studying <laughs> all day, right? Even today, you can see in Queens, right? Sections of Queens, you have these schools called uh, yeshiva. So yeshiva. This is a Jewish uh, school of learning, uh, of of, of Judaism and so forth. And you have, these schools are open, right? They're, they're open to the public. If you want to go study, you can go. Uh, some people study there all day, right? So Judaism had become the religion of studying, the religion of the intellect, and the intellect had a very powerful role in the context of Judaism. You had to use your intellect to decipher the texts, to understand the details of the law. And so in becoming overly intellectual, Judaism had lost connection with the heart. And this is one of the main contributions of Hasidism, is to reconnect um, Jews to their hearts, right? And so there came to be a, uh, the Hasidim decided, or they, they, they worked very hard to um, awaken their communities and, the, and the, 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 the Jewish communities around them to awaken them to the importance of our emotional connection with the creator. It's not just an intellectual connection. The heart also has a role to play. Do you see how similar we are there to Sufism, right? Where they were saying what matters is love, not so much the understanding, right? Very similar. Let me tell you a story that Buber tells um, in one of his books called um, Gog and Magog, um, he, he tells this story, and this will give you a sense of how important the emotions were, uh, or the heart, state of the heart were for the Hasidim. So here's a story. So um, this was a rabbi, a story is about a rabbi who um, happened to have a friend who was 
Right. Today would be the equivalent of the head of the mafia or the, 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 the head drug dealer of the neighborhood. A horrible person, right? <laughs> very, very sinful, <laughs> making all kinds of crooked deals all day long. And this rabbi was best friends with that guy, right? And they would hang out in the local pubs and they would drink and laugh and talk. And so the, the disciples of the rabbi were like, what are you doing hanging out with this thug right this is not you're a rabbi you're supposed to be with religious people why are you hanging out with this criminal this sinner and the rabbi said you know this guy i love him because he's always so happy he's always cheerful he's always laughing on the other hand when i'm with you people <laughs> You guys are always depressed and brooding and anxious about something. I love this guy. I don't care that he's doing all this stuff, right? For me, I'm inspired by his joy, right? Now, it's going to be interesting to interpret the story. The story has meaning, right? It tells us something about what Hasidism teaches. Does anybody know what is the meaning of the story? What is the rabbi telling us through his friendship with this criminal and through his admiration of the criminal's joy. What, what does the criminal have that is so worthy of the rabbi's company? What do you think? What's the meaning of the story? What's the story telling us about true spirituality or true closeness to God? He's so connecting, you, he's connecting with the, it's instead of intellectually, He's connecting like heart, uh, heart to heart or openness, more human connection rather than Okay, so he's intellectual. But still, I mean, you know, how can you be with this guy, right? He's a sinner. What kind of connection, what kind of influence is this guy going to have on you? What, how can the rabbi, what is the rabbi really saying when he says, I'm with this guy, this guy is worth being with. Why is this guy so, so, so worth being with? What do you think? So I see one answer, Koralash, really explain. What do you mean by happiness? What do, you, uh, what do you mean when you say happiness? Where's Koralash really? Okay, while Koralash really comes back. Rivera, you had your hand up? Oh, uh, yeah. Ah, you're can back. You okay. yeah. Explain to us, please. <laughs> that he's just going with life, uh, through life with joy instead of... Um, focusing on things that, like the rabbis that are like too focused on their religion, he's just focusing on. So what is, what is the, what's so great about this joy? What does this joy tell us about this criminal? That's what you have to figure out, right? The rabbi is hanging out with this criminal because of his joy. What is so special about that criminal's joy, or that sinner's joy? What does it tell us about this sinner? So Rivera, you had your hand up also. Do you want to say something? Um, I was typing it, but I was saying how um, the rabbi isn't judging him for his like for the life that he chooses to live, like he might be a horrible person, but he's able to make the rabbi feel a certain amount of joy that when he's with other people, it's not the same. Like it's genuine, I guess. Okay, good. You're on the right track. Remember, the rabbi admires this guy. What is so what is what what is so great about this guy's joy? What does this guy's joy, what does this criminal's joy tell us about this guy? You see what I'm saying? What is the, how shall I put it? Um, why is the rabbi so admirative? Admirative, that's not the word. Why does he admire so much this guy's joy? What does it tell us about this person that he's always joyful? In other words, what is the spiritual meaning of his joy? See if you can get it. <laughs> These stories are difficult, difficult to interpret. In other words, let me ask it like this. Uh, yes, Acevedo, he has freedom. So yeah, this is what's happening, right? The flaws don't matter anymore. This is un unheard of, right? It's like his flaws don't matter because he has joy. 
what does this mean? How is it that his flaws don't matter anymore and his sins don't matter anymore because he has this joy? What is so special about this joy? What does it tell us about this guy? Um, in other words, let me ask you like this. So imagine a disciple of the rabbi who is always sad and then the criminal who is always joyful, okay? Who do you think is closer to God? the law-abiding sad person or the sinning happy person what do you think okay shibilia yes excellent shibilia you got it right joy is a sign that he's connected to the creator you you can't be sad if you're connected to god or to the creator you're so the joy is a symptom that this criminal in spite of his sins has found a way to connect powerfully with the creator do you follow me right so so you can't so if you have like the the, the rabbi's disciple who is doing all the laws and keeping all the rituals but he's sad he has missed the point he hasn't connected he's doing all these rituals for nothing there is no connection there that is evident through his joy and so the criminal even though he's a sinner is actually closer to god than the law-abiding um rabbinic student right let me see uh, borkova says you can be a very righteous person and never feel any true happiness or connection to god yet by being flawed you can still experience true happiness with god exactly what the rabbi saw in that in that sinner was a a, a an intimate bond with the creator which was manifest through joy right if you're not joyful it means you've lost the connection do you see how powerful this is hasidism is amazing because basically say the rules don't matter if you have found joy you're there you don't need to do anything anymore you have reached the highest level right because what really matters is the connection it's not what you do and the rituals that you keep and the laws that you abide with it, what really matters is the connection and if you have joy it means you have the connection does everybody understand what i'm saying say yes can i hear you so basically what you're saying that you connect with god for your joy exactly joy is a sign that you've connected with the creator and so even though you're not doing any of the rules it doesn't matter because you've reached the highest level you've reached where the rules are trying to get you to so for the rabbi this thug or this criminal had reached the highest level of spirituality because he was joyful because joy is a symptom of a connection with the creator and so that's why the rabbi was in a way not trying to help this guy. He was admiring this guy and trying to learn from him. This is incredible. You never hear this kind of stories in religious circles, right? What, what Hasidism is saying is that what matters is the connection. And whatever you are doing, whatever you believe, whoever you are, if you have joy, you're there. In other words, you could, I'm, I'm gonna stretch it a bit, but you could be a complete pagan. If you have joy, you, you're higher than the highest rabbi who is melancholic, right? If you can be a, a, an atheist, if you have joy, you're there. You don't need all of these scriptures. You don't need all of these rituals. You have reached the highest level. This is how subversive Hasidism is. It's, it's often not seen. I don't think people understand how subversive it is. What really is happening is that what matters to Hasidism is the connection, and the sign that you have a connection is the joy. And so it doesn't matter if you're sinning, if you believe the wrong thing, if you're not doing any of the, the, uh, the commandments, if you have the joy, you've already, you're, already, you're already there, okay? Does everybody understand this? Everybody get this? Say yes, please, I can't hear you, I feel alone. Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, I can hear you. Otherwise I feel like I'm talking to a screen. Okay, all right, now let's look at the second point of Hasidism and I'll also tell you a story, right? Now there's another, issue in Judaism that Hasidism was worried about. And this was the way that Judaism had become more and more isolated, isolationist. And I mean, in other words, they were living more and more separated from the world. They had their own villages, they had their own communities, they hardly ever saw anybody else. This was 19th century Europe, of course, right? Now, there, was, there were political reasons for this, right? The Jews were persecuted throughout Eastern Europe and Russia, 
where most Jews lived, they were persecuted. And so the natural reflex was to recoil on themselves, right? So there are reasons for this. But Hasidism was not happy with this because they felt that this is not good. We are keeping our light to ourselves. We are not being, we are not sharing our light with the world. We are not sustaining the world with our presence, right? The Hasidim really believed that, that uh, Judaism was one of the pillars of the universe. It held the world together. And Judaism was meant to shine and influence and sustain the world and not withdraw in isolation, right? So their belief is that Jews should be everywhere, <laughs> right? Sharing their light, the, the light of their presence, right? With the world and, and in that way, sustaining the world, right? But they, so they didn't like this. So, so they didn't like actually, so in addition to this, they didn't like the separation that many Jews made between the sacred and the profane. In other words, we Jews are holy. Here we are. Let's not touch these guys over there, the profane. Uh, first of all, let's make sure you, all, you understand what the difference, right? Sacred and profane. What is profane? Let me make sure everyone understands this word. What's profane? I'm waiting for you. <laughs> what is the meaning of profane? Uh, almost um, it's worldly, I would say, right? Profane simply means worldly. Um, I'm going to write it down for you, right? Worldly. So in other words, or universal, right? So anything that is part of the world out there, which is not Jewish, right? Which is not part of the Jewish community is called profane. It's not necessarily sinful, but it's not holy, <laughs> right? So there was, there was a separation that was being made more and more between the holy community over here and the profane over there, and they never met, right? And so the rabbi started to say, well, you know, even the profane, the God's presence can be found there, right? Even these uh, these people or these communities or these actions which are not religious can have a spark of the divine in them. So they really believe that, that the divine was not the property of the Jews. You could find holiness everywhere, in every person out there in the profane world, in every task out there which doesn't seem holy. There was a spark of the divine, right? And so the, the holy was everywhere. Everything was holy. Every human being had an element of holiness. It wasn't just the Jews, right? So, so this is another interesting contribution of Hasidism, where for them, holiness is found in all, in every aspect of existence, in the holy as well as in the profane, in the Jewish community as well as in the world. You can find moments of holiness, right? experiences of holiness. So let me tell you another story that the rabbis tell to, to drive this point home. So this is a story about another rabbi. And this rabbi was very, very pious, very religious, and he loved to wake up at six in the morning and, you know, start his prayers and begin studying the scripture. And he would light his candle because it was still not quite daylight. And he would begin studying. And he had a neighbor who was out there in the world, profane, and this guy was a blacksmith. He made, uh, what, what do blacksmiths make? I don't know, pots and pans, right? Uh, he was working with metal. And this blacksmith, he noticed, was waking up earlier than him. In other words, the rabbi would wake up at six, but when he would get to his study, to his window, he would hear already the blacksmith working. And he was thinking, wait a second, I'm doing a sacred work here. This guy is doing nothing right? He's doing this trivial thing, pots and pans, right? How is he waking up earlier than me? No, 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 no. I'm going to wake up earlier than him because my task is more important. So he sits down, he tries the next day, 5.30, gets up, gets to his study, opens the window, blacksmith is already there since five. So he did continue, right? He continues, five o'clock, always the blacksmith is earlier, 4.30, he's already pounding away. Four. One day he gets tired. He comes out. It's four in the morning. He goes to the blacksmith and he's like, hey, why you wake up so damn early? That makes me have to wake up earlier now to compete with you because my task is, right? I mean, and, and he goes, you know, if it, and the blacksmith is like, 
you know, and, and the rabbi tells him, you know, if you knew how, how, how important my task is, right, you would understand that I have to wake up earlier than you, so please stop coming so early. And the blacksmith responds and he says, you know, I've been thinking the same thing. <laughs> Each time I see you coming earlier than me, I think, if only this guy knew how important my task was, my task, making pots and pans, he would understand that I have to wake up earlier than him because my task is so important, right? So both in a way are saying, if you only knew how important my task was, and this is why I have to wake up earlier than you. Now, does anybody, can anybody interpret this story? It's another riddle. What is the story telling us? Um, that should remind you of what I explained to you just now. What's the meaning of this story? That both the blacksmith and the rabbi think that their work is the most important work, more important than what the other one is doing. All right, I'm listening to your interpretations. Um, that any type of work is important, whether it be holy or profane. Exactly, right? The idea is that every work, everything that every human being feels called to do is a calling from the creator, right? If you feel called to be a blacksmith, you are, you are in a way carrying out the destiny that the creator has for you. If you feel called to be a fireman, same thing. If you feel called to be a rabbi, it's the same thing. Every calling, every task is holy. Everything has um, sparks of the divine in it, right? So they're, they're really saying that, and so the, 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 and there's so many stories like this, which are priceless, right? It's the idea really that whatever you're, they had a, 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 um, another um, a belief that whatever you're doing, if you do it with 100%, is going to lead you to God, right? Make sure you write this down because this is also important, right? So, so the rabbis, the Hasidim believe that whatever you're doing, even if it's like, you know, garbage man, right? If you do it 100%, you're going to find God in that task if you put your whole heart into it, right? And, and this could be anything. They, I think there is a story which goes even as far as to say that if you are a criminal and you are 100% a criminal, you will find God, <laughs> right? So, so there's this idea, right, that what matters is not the task, it's how you do it, how unified your consciousness is, how wholehearted you are as you're doing it. That's what matters, not so much what you're doing, but how wholehearted you are as you're doing it, right? Because what matters, again, is the internal for the Hasidim. If you're wholehearted, if you're passionate about something, you're very close to God, right? You are in a state of worship. You are in a state of communion with the divine right so so this this is just to give you an idea right of, of the this 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 uh, amazing uh development in judaism which was so out there right so so subversive so so uh, extraordinary and so we're going to see right as i get into buber's works the influence right we're going to see how hasidim has deeply actually influenced um his his own philosophical work okay so after this encounter with Hasidism, going back now to his biography, um, Buber actually goes back to Judaism. Um, he becomes actually very um, involved in Judaism. I believe he was part of a translation uh, project of the, of the Hebrew Bible. He, he wrote a number of essays also on Zionism, on the state of Israel. Um, obviously, he wrote a lot of um, books on uh, Judaism, but he also wrote philosophy, right? He's also, in, in my view, he's principally, uh, primordially a philosopher, right? So in, um, in 1923, so he's in Vienna, right? So in, in 1896, he begins his philosophical studies. In 1923, he, he writes I and Thou. In 1930, he starts working in Germany now. He moves to Germany, and this is not a good time, but there he is in 1930 working at the University of Frankfurt. And then, of course, Hitler comes to power in 1933. And at that moment, Jews are asked to resign their positions, right? So he resigns. Um, he's forbidden to lecture. He's forbidden to teach. And so he decides wisely <laughs> to move to Jerusalem in 1938, right? And he teaches there till the end of his life at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, in addition to, of course, 
you know, his travels around the world. He's well known. He, he, he lectures in the United States, in, 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 in Europe, right? He's, he's um, and yeah, so that's his Bible. <laughs> okay, so now let's go a little bit into his thought. Um, and we first have to look at the political context, right? Um, <clears throat> because really, Buber, in the work I and Thou, right, that we're about to read, uh, it, it, this is really a political work. This is a work which is responding to a certain political climate, right? This is his contribution. This is his revolt with regards to what is going on uh, around the time that he's writing this. Now, he's, this is before Hitler, right? This is in the, around World War I, around the Bolshevik Revolution. This is the rise of, of uh, Lenin uh, uh, and, and so forth. And in Russia, you have also different things are going on in Europe that are already leading to Nazism, but it's not yet the full-fledged, right? So, uh, so let me talk a little bit about the climate of the times uh, to which he's responding, uh, and then we can understand a little better what he's doing, and then we'll go into his terminology, right? So the main, I think the main thing that is going on politically and ideologically around that time is what I would call the rise of materialism, I'm writing it down, and the demise of the spiritual or the sacred, right? Okay, this is really in a nutshell what is happening, what has been happening in Europe since the 1800s, right? It's been slowly growing with the rise of science, right? We have slow more and more interest in the material realm and a slow uh, forgetfulness of the dimensions of the sacred, of mystery, of the spiritual, all of this is slowly being shelved away, right? We have a rise of materialism, meaning by which I mean all that exists is what is, there is nothing else, there is nothing hidden. There's nothing in the background. In other words, we are just animals. There is no soul or spirit. There is no God. We are just, and, and it, it went further than animals. We are just parts of a big machine, <laughs> right? The machine of society. And we are just, right, parts of this machine. And, and we are just there to function in society so there was more and more a loss of the sense that the human being has this kind of dimension of sacredness right human beings came to be seen at best as animals and at worst as means to an end right so now you should be hearing Kant right so let me say that again right there is a rise of the mentality of means end actually let me say that differently uh, there's a loss, a gradual uh, loss of what Kant called respect. So let's go there a little bit. Remind me, what is, we had this in the test. What is respect for Kant? What does it mean to respect another human being? Let's see if you remember. To not use them. Okay, very good, Corella Shuli, right? So when, when you respect another human being, you realize that you are here in front of an entity or a being which is more than an object, right? So if I take my pencil, my pencil I can use, and then I can throw away when I'm done with it, right? Uh, human beings differ, right? As soon as you begin to use a human being, you're losing a sense of what is sacred about them, of, of what you should not of what you cannot touch, of what you cannot control or grasp, right? As soon as you use a human being, you, you are infringing on their sacredness, right? Same when you discard them when you're done, <laughs> but it's another way to lose the respect, to infringe on their sacredness, right? So Kant had talked about this very nicely. What's happening in the time of Buber is a slow loss of this respect, right? People are being more and more ruthlessly used. And we are forgetting that there should be a limit to how we interact with people. People are not animals. They're not forests. They're not objects. We should have, we should put a check on how we are with people. But this is, this is not happening anymore around the, the 19th century, right? Uh, let me give you some examples, right? For example, 
uh, you have several, several things that are happening which testify to the way that we are losing this sense of the respect of the human being. And by the way, we are not far from that time. We are very much still uh, thinking along similar lines. No, example number one, the exploitation of workers. Still going on today. <laughs> okay, how is this a loss of the sacredness of the human being when we exploit masses of people? Tell me. What is how, so we're exploiting masses of people, we're getting uh, money, we're getting uh, profit, but what are we losing when we do that as a society? Because we're doing that as a society. What are we losing when we ruthlessly exploit masses of people in order to get cheaper goods or profits? What are we losing in the process? Tell me. <clears throat> Uh, I mean, we're losing a part of our humanness because we're using others. We're exploiting other people to benefit, or if you're exploiting a mass of people to benefit one, or a couple people, right? A small population, you're losing a part of your humanity. Exactly. Very good, right? So we are profiting economically from this exploitation, right? but we're losing our humanity. We're losing a sense of the humanity of the other, right? This is, I think, what Koralashvili said, we're dehumanizing them, and in doing so, we're dehumanizing ourselves. We're gonna talk about this with Buber, right? Uh, and then, of course, uh, one more person, Borkova talks about we're losing our integrity. It's, it's even more than that. We're losing our humanity, right? So this is the first way that still today, collectively, as a society, we are doing this. A lot of the things we are buying, right, is, found is, 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 is coming out of this exploitation of workers. And I'm the first one to be making these purchases right now. I'm thinking I sh I'm starting to feel guilty right now. <laughs> right? So we are part of this, right? And so, yes, we get cheaper goods. Yes, we get, you know, profits. Yes, you know, we don't have to pay high wages. And so we, we, we have, you know, we don't have to pay so much when we purchase or um, we don't have to, right? We, we get some profits. So, this is happening, but at the same time, we are dehumanizing a whole, we are losing the respect, we're losing a sense of the sacred, of the fact that a human being needs to be protected and not used, right? Um, and in doing so, we'll see with Buber, um, this is not something that Kant talked about, but Buber is going to add to what Kant is saying. Not only are we losing uh, a sense of the sacred in the other human being, we are losing our own humanity. Make sure you write this down, right? So when you dehumanize another, you're not just taking something from them, you're taking something from yourself. You're losing something from, we are losing our own humanity as we are dehumanizing others, right? So that's the first one. The second way that we are losing the sense of the sacred is um, the, the way that we the the uh, is is the way that we easily right go to war and this was the case in in Europe and during the first and second world wars right now we're more careful at least Europe is right we in the states we still haven't understood I think we still love to go to war but in Europe after the two world wars we were like okay no more right but at the time at the time of Buber we were just right it was easy war was a decision like this you you know if you provoke me okay let's go to war and we would just send masses of youth into these senseless wars that came out of some ego um uh how shall i put it wound <laughs> right so so this idea of sending the youth to war uh drafting the youth to go to war to fight for us right also is a problem because they are again right this is again taking human beings and using them in order to again not protect ourselves right this is not the case often when we go to war i mean especially us in our country right when we go to war it's often for economic purposes business purposes we have an agenda where we go to war right and so if it was protection it would be another story right but our economic agendas, our, our imperialistic agendas are behind the way that we use these young people 
for our wars. And again, Buber is saying, of course, it's normal if there is a war, we are under attack, we have to defend ourselves. That's different from going to war uh, with, you know, economic business purposes in mind, right? So, so this is another way that we exploit and use huge segment of our population, right? And in doing so, we are losing our own humanity also, right? And finally, you could expand this, of course, um, to the way, I mean, I'm going to do that, <laughs> but we are also, no, let's not do that because that's not what Buber says, but you could, I'll just say, you can also extend this argument to the way that we use nature, right? Uh, and the way that we exploit nature, uh, again, losing the sense of sacredness of nature and seeing it just as a means to an end. That's a whole other debate, <laughs> right? Uh, which has to do with environmental ethics and so forth. But you could also make that case. Okay, so, so you see a little bit how in the context of Buber with the exploitation of workers, the, um, the willingness and eagerness to go to war, um, the, the rise also of totalitarianism, right? The political system. So let me add this one, right? The rise of totalitarian regimes is also part of this whole mentality that human beings are there to build a nation, right? They don't have any other purpose than to build the economy. This was really the, the case in Marxism and, and, um, and uh, communism in, in those contexts. The human being was just there to contribute to the economy. That's your purpose. Don't start, you know, having free thoughts and ideas and, and you know, emotions. Right? This is not uh, what we need from you. We need you to be a functional citizen. We have a variation of this in our lives here in the US too, with the way that we don't allow ourselves to falter, right? We are constantly working, overworking. There is no time for family. There is no time to be depressed. There is no time for vacation, right? We are also strictly our our value is completely reduced to our use to to how well we are functioning that's what matters right nothing else matters and you see that in the corporate world where you you can't you don't you don't have the luxury for a vacation you don't have a luxury to raise a family you don't have the luxury to be depressed <laughs> or anxious right same idea right so the rise of totalitarianism in the context of boomer um, i should tell you a funny story about that too I might have some time. Yeah, let me tell you a um, yeah, funny story about uh, Stalin. Uh, Stalin and, how do you tell Stalin? And Shostakovich. So I'm writing it completely off. Shostakovich, he's, um, oh, maybe that's it. Okay, I'm gonna go like this. Okay, so these are the two names I want you to remember. So Stalin and Shostakovich. Does anybody know who Shostakovich is? He's living at the time of Stalin in, in Russia. Anybody have any inkling as to who this guy is? Okay, so I will tell you. All right, so Shostakovich was a musician. Uh, he was a classical musician. He would compose symphonies for orchestras and so forth, right? So he's living at the time of Stalin. And of course, Stalin is trying to build a society. He's trying to build the economy. And for that, he needs strong people who are disciplined and especially who are eager to do this, right? Energized, upbeat, right? Building the economy. Now, Shostakovich, he's kind of the oddball in the whole story because he's not upbeat. He's not energetic. In fact, he's suffering from terrible anxiety. So as a person, he's constantly anxious and nervous and, and, and uh, uncomfortable in life. And so when he composes, the pieces he composes turn out really anxious and they make you anxious to listen, to listen to them. So he's writing all these anxious pieces for orchestra and everybody's you know, being affected by this. And so one day Stalin calls Shostakovich to his office and he's like, what are you doing? I'm trying to build this nation. I'm trying to build the economy. I need people to be happy and you're making everybody depressed and anxious with your music. In fact, at this, at, from now on, I forbid you to write this type of music. So Shostakovich, even more anxious now, goes home. He doesn't know what to do with himself. So he composes a war symphony in the honor of Stalin. And if any of you are familiar with this particular war symphony, 
it is actually a parody. It is making fun of Stalin throughout the whole piece. But Stalin is so simple-minded, he doesn't notice. <laughs> so, so he has a lot of effects in the, in the piece where, and, and I, I don't have too much detail to go into it, but the whole piece is a kind of satirical war symphony. He's making fun of war. He's making fun of the pomp. He's making fun of the arrogance of Stalin. But Stalin, because he's kind of simple-minded, he doesn't notice and he says, ah, well done, Shostakovich, you did good. I, I, it's called the war symphonies. There are several and they're all in the same style, making fun of war, making fun of uh, Stalin in his face without him uh, noticing. I, I've, I have to look into which number it is, but I know that the, the actual name is called the war symphonies. Um, so this gives you an idea, right, of totalitarian regime. In a totalitarian regime, your feelings uh, hold on, Coralashvili, you're giving me some numbers. What is that? <laughs> what do these numbers mean? <clears throat> my, 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 we can't hear you. <laughs> Maybe you can type up what you meant. That way we can know what you're saying. <laughs> Oh, I was an accident. Okay. <laughs> All right. Where was I? Okay. Yeah. So this story just gives you an idea, right? How a totalitarian regime works. People matter in as much as they're building the economy. If they're anxious, if they're going through stuff, if they don't agree, if they have other ideas, we can have that, right? And in fact, Stalin was well known for repressing anybody who had different ideas, who was kind of, you know, not fitting into his, you know, idea. Of, of what society should look like. He, he, he executed and exiled hundreds of thousands of intellectuals, artists, people who had the audacity to not be useful to society, <laughs> right? And, and who questioned his policies, right? So this gives you an idea, right? Of how the totalitarian regime also, human beings are just a means to building the economy. There's no other purpose. And to be honest, in our country with all of our freedoms, we're going in that direction, right? With this idea that what matters is my productivity. <laughs> and if I'm not productive, who am I, <laughs> right? And we have an emphasis on productivity to the point of burning ourselves out to death, right? Um, you're not there yet, but when you enter the workforce, you'll see, <laughs> right? So that's the same idea. Human being is useful in as much as they're productive. Uh, anything else doesn't matter. Their family life doesn't matter. Their, the crisis they're going through it, uh, emotionally doesn't matter uh, and so forth, right? The, the leisure they need, the, the rest they need doesn't matter. What matters is to be productive as much as possible, right? Same idea, human beings as a means to an end. Are you getting the picture, <laughs> right? So Buber is not only talking to his own uh, political context, we are still in that same political context where people are have value only in as much as they are useful contributors to the society. And if you're not a useful, productive person, you're nobody, right? So Buber is, so Buber is going to respond to that and say, uh, and this is the part you need to write down, right? Um, in other words, what we're seeing is a rise of this, um, or ra rather, a progressive loss of the sense of the sacredness of the human being, of the inherent value of the human being, of the fact that they have value, even if they're not productive, right? We're losing this, right, slowly. And we're becoming more and more materialistic and less and less human. That's in essence Buber's diagnostic, diagnosis of our societies, right? Let me say that again, right? So his diagnosis is as follows, I'm gonna type it, diagnosis. Uh, one, we have a, a, a gradual loss of sacredness of life, and two, uh, increase of materialistic, right, um, increase of materialistic concerns, right. This is where we are. I mean, we are still in the same context, right, that Buber is describing. So Buber is going to respond to that. And the whole book I endow is, is his response to this slow 
uh, degradation of the holy, of the sacred. Uh, and he's going to use two, two concepts that, so now we're going into the concepts, the I thou or I you, it's the same, right? Or, and the I it, okay? Um, so I'm going to use I thou, even though in the book it's I you, so I'm just going to, it's the same thing, right? Because some translations say I thou, some translations say I you. Um, so I'm just going to probably go back and forth because I'm used to both translations, right? So, okay. So first of all, his diagnosis of our society is that we are uh, 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 becoming more and more a society uh, structured as an I-it relationship. Okay, so what does, so now that you know a little bit, I've told you a little bit, what does he mean when he say that we're becoming more and more structured as an I-it relationship as a society? How would you explain this notion, I, it? It's, it's, a, it's a relationship, it's a, it's a way we relate to each other as an I, it. What does he mean? We're becoming more like materialistic. Like yes, go, go deeper. Oh. What does it mean to relate to another human being as an it? There's the I connecting to an it. What is he saying? But the it is a person or is it the material? It's the person, right? We are oh, seeing yeah. the person as an it. That's what he's saying, right? A relationship that doesn't see... get in early and make sure everything works. They're more of an object. They're an object. Yeah. Exactly. They're more objects rather than humans. So. Exactly. You got it. And Rivera says a relationship that doesn't see the other person as an object, or, or rather sees a person as an object and you, uh, has a lesser, right? So when, so the I, it relationship that Buber describes is a relationship where the I am relating to another human being as an it, I, it, okay? And this he's saying is the way most of us relate nowadays. And, and it's true. <laughs> most of us see people as a means to an end. Whether we are in the corporate world, in the political world, in relationship world, we are really becoming more and more in, Pro, uh, more and more uh, gifted at this I it relationship, right? So this is really a, a very relevant and pertinent diagnosis for us today because a lot of our relationships are falling under that category. Even the way we relate to our parents or our beloveds is becoming more and more of an I it relationship. In other words, if you're not useful to me anymore, we're done, right? Or I'm going to be with you because I sense that you can be useful to me. Right. And the corporate world is entirely built around that structure. Right. The, the worker is there to be a source of profit. We don't care about the life of this worker or whether they're happy or whether they can feed their families. We are squeezing them <laughs> until we get everything we can out of them. Right. And they're still somewhat alive. Right. Same idea. Right. So so we are very much whether it is in, in the job, right, in, in the um, can't talk today, uh, whether we are talking in the workplace, right, or in the family, we are very much thinking along those lines. Right. And Buber is saying this is tragic, not only for the people we are exploiting, but for us. Right. This is an important point that as we continuously dehumanize others, we are actually losing our own humanity, right? So the more we accumulate in profits, the less human we are, we are losing that. We're gaining over here materially, but we're losing spiritually, right? Um, so of course, Buber is saying we need to recover this ancient way of relating or this forgotten way of relating to others as a sacred dimension, and this he calls <clears throat> the I-thou relationship, right? Or the I-you. In other words, I am relating to, to the other human being as a you. I am connecting to this human being, not as an it, but as a you. And this you entails a whole lot of things that we're gonna talk about, right? I haven't yet developed what it means to connect to a human being as a you, right? I mean, we just know one thing from Kant, it means you don't use them. But Buber is going to add to that, right? He's going to develop the Kantian notion of respect very deeply. And we're going to see uh, several, like uh, many, many different facets as to how we can rediscover the you in our relationships, right? That we are losing. So the IU is going to be a very complex um, dynamic 
which we will be studying throughout these next few weeks, right, with Bubu. Um, it entails far more than just not using. There's a lot more that we need to learn <laughs> if we are to recover or protect the dimension of the you in our relationships, right? So those are the two main concepts you'll see. And now you should be able to navigate um, more easily uh, his work. Let me say a few things about how he writes so that you're, you're ready because now we're leaving behind some pretty, um, I mean, Kierkegaard was writing in a way, trying to be clear, you know, he was, you could understand, Kant to a certain degree, everybody. So Buber, we're entering now the 20th century and the style is going to change, right? So with Buber and also Irigaray, whom we're going to study, the style is going to change. And I want to talk a little bit about that so you have an idea um, when you go in as to how he's working. So what you're going to notice is that Buber, there's no argument and there's not even like, uh, um, explanations. Buber is writing little fragments. <laughs> You'll have a paragraph about something and then boom, he's going to stop and then move to another paragraph about something. And they're all little snapshots, all little glimpses, right, of what he's trying to say. Now, why does he write like this, right? And of course, he doesn't explain anything. His language is very obscure. His language is actually, he's writing almost like the Hasidim. He, you can sense it's, everything is a riddle. Everything you read is a riddle that is meant to be deciphered. Okay, so let me ask you, why do you think he writes like this? Fragmented, in riddles, what is he trying to do? Why does he hide himself or the meaning of his philosophy? Why does he um, use it? Why does he, why does he <coughs> express himself in this way? Can anybody take a wild guess? <clears throat> Maybe it encourages the audience to think a certain way, think a little deeper about themselves as a person. Okay, very good, right? If he's writing in riddles, it's an invitation for us to mull over the riddle, to reflect on it, to, to kind of let the riddle awaken our own thought processes, right? So in a way, the riddle is there to awaken our own thinking, to get us thinking about these things ourselves, right? Very good. Rivera, he wants people to put an effort and try to think. Yes, absolutely, right? He's wanting us to start thinking and not just being brainwashed. This is the problem with society, right? We are brainwashed. So he wants to awaken this in us, right? <sighs> going deeper. Borkova, he leaves it open to interpretation. Absolutely, right? In fact, we're going to study Buber together in the same way that we did Rumi, right? Because Anything he's talking about is like, it's a riddle, which we will need each other to really get the full meaning of it, right? So, so he's trying to get us to think, he's trying to um, awaken something in us, right? Uh, some of the other reasons why he writes fragmented is that he's living in a fragmented world, right? Everything has been, um, in a way, everything has exploded after the two world wars, People lose the sense of what is true, what makes sense, what, what, where are we, who are we, <laughs> right? And so he's writing in this way because he himself has been fractured, right? There is, um, <clears throat> he realizes that the truth now can only be given in glimpses. We, we cannot have a clear vision of it. We, the war is in a way has shattered. Our intelligence has shattered our hearts. We can't see anymore but we can only get a few sparks here and there because we are just we have lost our vision of the truth that we used to have right so so that's another reason why he writes like that okay so so remember as you're reading him remember enjoy just enjoy not understanding because you won't understand too much <laughs> some you will understand some but some of it you won't it's okay just enjoy being in the presence of this great mind right and just, um, yeah. All right, any questions before we conclude? <laughs> any questions? Nope. All right, good. So you guys can go.